So our last speaker in this session, Dr. Bill Couture, the Assistant Dean for Undergraduate Medical Education at Vanderbilt University School of Medicine, and he will be talking on exploring trust in the entrustable professional activities, observations from the AAMC core EPA pilot. Thank you all for the opportunity to be here today. I'm very excited, and it's, it's quite fun that the idea of these EPAs has come up multiple times already throughout the course of the day. Some of the images, some of the ideas we've already talked about, and, and so I will just highlight that it connects to what we've talked about already. Um, I am speaking on behalf of this pilot group, and so for many of whom are actually in the room, so hopefully I represent you all well. Um, so let's dive in. So again, I think we've talked about this idea of a continuum multiple times throughout the course of today that we really are focusing right now on that piece that's between the med school and residency, but there's also entrustment that happens when the residency moves into the practice realm, et cetera. But we really are focusing right there for today. I don't need to belabor this point. It was made by multiple speakers this morning, the idea that there was a gap between what is expected of trainees on day one of residency and what we as the UME programs are delivering. There's also a gap, if you dive into the literature, between what the students feel ready for at times, what they're actually ready for at times, and then what they're asked to do. So there are times where they're being asked to do things that they either aren't ready for actually or they don't even think they're ready for. And so there's a gap there also. And so trying to better align what are those expectations for graduation from medical school. And so that was part of the driving force behind this task force. You know, many of you have seen these purple books, as we lovingly refer to them. It started in January of 2013 with the formation of the drafting panel. A lot of tremendous work that went in identifying what are those core things that every medical school graduate should be able to do when we hand them over to you. There was an advisory panel. And then out of that came these two purple books, which is really two versions of the same thing. One that is a overview for the learners, overview for frontline faculty, and one that's for those of us that do a lot more curriculum thinking that's a lot more detailed, a lot more information. And again, both of those resources are available online. Again, this should look very familiar to you. George talked about this, and the idea that there are multiple pieces that funnel up towards the EPA. So again, just to make sure we're all clear about the language, we talk about domains of competence, and then the competencies under that. The milestones are the behaviors that you can actually see in the trainee that funnel towards whether or not you think they have developed that competency yet or not. But that ultimately at the top of that is this EPA, which is a unit of work. And that was the distinction as we wrestled with early on it. The EPA is something I'm going to entrust you to go and do versus a characteristic, a skill that you are developing. So the EPA is, I can point to you and say, I want you to go do X. And the X there is the EPA, driving the car, for example. So again, this slide should look very familiar. We shamelessly steal from OHSU because they shared it with the pilot because this was a nice way to start to visualize what some of these 13 core EPAs are. Some of them, as Dr. Pangaro also alluded to, are fairly low level. They should be able to do fairly easily with not a lot of stakes. If you think about doing an oral presentation, if you think about taking history and physical, the stakes on that aren't really high. Most of our students, I think, probably already do it. And we have found, at least in some local data, we actually have a lot of data to say, yes, they're able to do a good history and physical. There's some, however, that are a little bit higher stakes. Entering orders, informed consent, uh, recognizing and initiating treatment for a deteriorating patient. If they were asked to do that on day one of residency, that's a lot more involved with that. The informed consent, I think, is actually a great example. One of my students recently was on an away rotation, a future neurosurgeon, was asked to do an informed consent for a tumor removal. He's a fourth year medical student visiting an institution, and he was the one in charge of doing informed consent for a brain tumor removal. I would argue as a medical student, he probably didn't have all of the information needed to provide to that family for them to be fully informed. So again, there's a lot, the risks are there. Okay, ideally, we have this little student here. And we want, you want us to be able to give them that stamp of approval so when they graduate us, right now that stamp really is in the form of an MD or a DO degree. Ideally, you would like that stamp to say they are entrustable to do those 13 things, but right now I think there's that, that gap. The stamp comes with the letters, but not necessarily a full understanding of what we're able to do. And so that's where this pilot came from. And so the pilot really started in October of 2014 with our first uh, assembly together. We looked at trying to roll things out with that class that entered in the fall of 2015. The target, though, is to be able to do some summative entrustment decision-making around the class that graduates not next spring, but the spring after that. 
So for the schools that have a two, traditional kind of two plus two curriculum, those students who are hoping to make decisions on enter the clerkship phase this fall. So the work that has led up to now is to get ready for that class and to start thinking about that. Granted, some of the schools in this pilot have students starting in the clerkships earlier, Vanderbilt being one of those. And then we really want to study some of those concepts along the way about implementation and is this doable? Are there lessons that we can learn from this pilot that we can share with others? So you can see the 10 schools that are part of this pilot. But I did want to just highlight the vision there. So optimizing safe and effective patient care. So much like the conversations this morning, we actually started with that patient safety lens first. And that's what drives everything else. And so how we're going to get there might be different from some of the things you're doing, but we're going to try to now get there by ensuring that each of our graduates is prepared for those core initial duties as an intern. And then you can see some of the, the, the aims related to that to facilitate that transition and then ultimately to share the lessons that we've learned, both the things that work as well as the things that don't. All right, so this is one way to try to, to visualize that progression from starting somewhere back down here, ultimately moving up towards practice without supervision there at the top. And that's ultimately the goal of GME, right? When they finish your GME training program and we send them out into the world, that is ultimately the place of no direct supervision. They are practicing on their own. That probably happens a little bit earlier in some of the GME programs for certain things, hopefully. But then where does the UME continuum fit into there? And so this is the scale that is often used in the GME world, practicing with full supervision, on-demand supervision, and then ultimately that without supervision. So we started with that as the big picture construct, and I'll show you in a minute a few of the, the kind of subtleties that we have added to that. So we found that a lot of the work early on was focused on the P and the A portion of the EPAs, the professional activities. What are they? We've listed the 13, a lot of thought and effort that went into how do we measure those, what are the right skills involved with all of that. But the entrustment piece is probably the one that's going to be the biggest uh, sticking point, right? Because ultimately you want entrustment on two frames. You want to be able to know if that student is entrustable to go and do the activity. But the flip side is you as the GME programs also want to entrust that once we have deemed someone entrustable that they actually are. So we have to do things in a way that provides that evidence to allow you to believe what we, the UME people, have said. And so one of the papers that was actually really helpful for our group was this from the international CBME collaborators, several of whom are in the room, um, where they talked about trust. And they defined trust within the medical context as the reliance of a supervisor or medical team on a trainee to execute a given professional task correctly and on his or her willingness to ask for help when needed. And I think that I love the fact that they included that second piece because I work uh, clinically in the pediatric ICU. And if I know one of my new fellows is able to ask for help when he or she needs it, I am far more able to actually trust them to do things because I know they're going to call and ask me for help when that need arises. They then made the link between that level of trust and selection of how much supervision is needed. And again, I just alluded to that in the ICU. The more I'm willing to trust that someone will call me when they need help, the more leash I will give them to act unsupervised in that fact. And so they dove more deeply into the paper into different types of trust. The presumptive trust that starts basically purely based on credentials. So if you have an MD, it's assumed that you can do certain things. The initial trust, which is kind of that gut level blink type decision about can I trust you, can I not? Moving towards the grounded trust, which is really informed by time. It's informed by data. Um, and from that come the two different types of entrustment. The first being the summative entrustment decisions that are really that end, pulling everything together, putting the final stamp of approval on it, versus the ad hoc entrustment decisions, which are a little bit more in the moment, second by second. Am I going to allow you as the learner who are in front of me with this patient to do this activity? And then the paper actually did a really nice job of laying out some of the things after that. The summative, which we'll come to in a few minutes, really based on grounded trust. So it has to be established over time. There has to be evidence that feeds into that. The ad hoc, they mentioned several different pieces that flow into that. Trustworthiness of the trainee, risk of the situation, urgency of the job to be done, and the suitability of the task for this moment. So for those of you that, that work clinically, think about a busy ER. There are certain individuals that suddenly become far more entrustable when the ER gets busier. Right? We've been there. You know that, oh, we've got 14 patients waiting to be seen. Why don't you just go see that one by yourself? And so we make some of those decisions based on not anything that has to do with the actual learner, but the context. And so I think it's important to highlight that. But the trustworthiness of the training is actually essential. And so we have spent a lot of time diving into that and trying to better understand that. Um, and a lot of our has work has been based on Tara Kennedy's work that was published back in, in 08 
in academic medicine where they looked at four different aspects of trustworthiness. The first being the knowledge and skill, which is specific to whatever the task is. Very important, and that's the P and the A portion of the EPAs. The other three, I would argue, is what helps us establish the trust component. So the discernment. Do they know where their own limitations are? Do they know where, oh, yeah, I probably need to call for help now. So that ability to know their own gaps, to have been able to identify those and then to ask for help. Conscientiousness, how thorough are they? Will they follow through? Can you believe if they say, I will get this done, that that will actually happen? Again, far more likely to let them do it if you know that you can trust that. And then truthfulness, to talk about the absence of deception, are they providing all of the information? It's a loaded word, right? Are they truthful? There were, we had a long discussion about, is this dichotomous? You're either truthful or you're not. There's some that argued very vehemently that that was the case. The question was then raised, how many of you have scanned into a grand rounds to get credit and left before it was over? Do you then fall into that no longer honest category and henceforth you're not honest? So there probably are some of the developmental stages in progression with that. And so we, we have tried to wrestle with that a little bit. The paper goes on to talk about different categories that actually play into this idea of entrustment, specifically in the moment, in those ad hoc decisions, so the trainee for sure that we just talked about, the supervisor. There might be things that I never let a trainee do regardless of how good they are. I might never let one of my trainees do an intubation without me physically at the bedside. That's not on them, that's on me. And it might be completely appropriate, but if I'm grading them and they're getting an honors grade based on this level of entrustment, that doesn't seem to, to be fair the context, circumstance I've alluded to earlier, whatever the task is, and then that relationship. If I've worked with someone for six months, day in and day out, I'm far more likely to know those things about whether or not I can trust them than if I, I've only worked with them for the first day. Again, I think that makes perfect sense, right? They went on to flush out, great. That's good for the ad hoc. You need all of those for the ad hoc. You probably need some of these also. But if you're gonna then deem someone summatively entrustable, there's a probably more things that go into it than just the ones that were on the last screen. And so they flushed out some of them, and they, they did not make the argument that these were all of them, but these were some based on their conversations as well as based on the literature. Empathy, openness, receptivity to patient feedback. Skills in that communication that we've talked about. Self-confidence, very interesting that that, that was included. Um, sense of responsibility. Habits of ongoing self-evaluation, reflection, and development. So if you know someone has an established pattern of that CQI mindset, they're always trying to make themselves better, the master adaptive learner, if you will, you're far more likely to engage them in a conversation and in a situation than in someone who feels like they know everything and they're just gonna go do it on their own. Again, you want that person who's showing growth. So circling back to this idea, Carrie Chin and the group published in 2015 some work that tried to flush this out into a little bit more detail at the UME level. So again, that's the previous scale was for the, for the GME level. This tried to then work through, okay, within that practicing with full supervision, are there different levels between that? And so there are, as she laid out, performing it as a co-activity, supervisor being present and ready to step in, but actually allowing the, the trainee to do it. Up in the on-demand supervision, different levels based on how much the supervisor is going to check or double check. And so this, these, the chin levels, if you will, that are 2A, 2B, 3, they provide a little bit more granularity, which we hope actually provides the ability to give better feedback to the students about where they are now and what it would take to maybe get to that next level. We've wrestled a lot with this, where should the UME entrustment level be? What should our target be to hand over to you? Is it 3A, is it 3B? Right now, we're somewhere in the middle there. Um, and we'll probably end up at one of those, but it definitely would be somewhere in that range. As George showed, we are starting to uh, experiment with trial different scales to how do we get out with our frontline faculty a shared mental model. Again, it's just, this is a synthetic model. It should be easier for those frontline faculty to use than some of the different competency and milestone language. We, th we think it is, and some preliminary data would say that yes, it probably is. So the supervisory scale is one that we have tried. Again, the wording on the left there being a little bit easier to say, what did you actually have to, or what would you actually do? They're based on the chin levels. One thing about the supervisory scale though, that is a little bit cognitively challenging or can be, is it's actually looking forward. What would you entrust them to do if you were placed with this type of situation again? So it's not actually documenting what you just did with them. It's looking forward, what might you entrust them to do going forward? So it's a little bit of a, of a frame shift. The flip side of that is the Ottawa scale, which Dr. Hamstrom mentioned this morning, that is a little bit more of what did you actually have to do with what just happened? 
So we're, we're actually trying to, to understand both of these scales and how they might inform us as we move towards entrustment. And so this is kind of a modified version of what was used in the surgical realm with the Ottawa scale that we think might give us a little bit more insight into this. So the faculty having to do it, having to talk them through it, directing them from time to time, and then was available just in case. Different schools are saying, I, this one makes more sense to me, so we're going to use this. And we don't know the answer. Um, at Vanderbilt, we're actually piloting a form that has both. We have some preliminary data that while we thought they would always track together, they don't. That you might have had different supervisors that had different levels of what they actually had to do in one situation and it might lead them to entrust in a different level in the future. And so we're trying to better understand how these two scales might be related. And so again, there's ongoing work in that arena. So a couple of big picture findings before we dive more deeply into what else the pilot is doing. Ad hoc entrustment decisions, so that's in the moment, they're intuitive, but they are influenced by several different factors. Those summative entrustment decisions that are kind of a little bit more um, pulling things together at the end, they, they require rigor, and we don't necessarily have all of that yet. These last two are really important. We need explicit measures of trustworthiness, and we need a little bit more standardization across our schools within the pilot. And so there was a lot of work from the entrustment group, which is one of the subgroups of this pilot, trying to do this. And so part of that was actually defining for our group what entrustment was. So it's possessing the requisite knowledge, skills, and attitudes related. So that's the, the P and the A portion of it. But we decided as a group, we absolutely explicitly need to assess trustworthiness. And so as a group have decided that is something that we're gonna do and then thinking about moving forward how to do that. So David Brown and his group, the intention is not to show all this, I'll blow it up in the next slide, but so that you have that in the slides, um, is to look at each of those three areas, the discernment, the truthfulness, and the conscientiousness they laid out a preliminary potential set of milestone observable behaviors that might provide for us how students develop each of these things related to trustworthiness. Um, there's a little bit of experience from a couple of the schools starting to measure this. When we polled the 10 schools part of the pilot, between two and three of them were actually doing anything to assess trustworthiness right now. And so we're like, okay, there's a big gap. We as a pilot group need to move forward and better assess that. And so this is one of the mechanisms that has been proposed. So specifically looking at discernment, um, there's a separate one looking at consciousness that has, as you'll see, a couple of different bands that try to get at that. And again, it's in the, the academic medicine paper from earlier this year. And then ultimately from truthfulness, also thinking that what are those developmental stages that a student might progress through that allowed you to know as their faculty that yes, they probably are being more truthful this year than they were last year uh, related to that. The core EPA came out with 13 guiding principles after a fair amount of work. These are the seven that really relate to that summative entrustment, however. Um, and they're really important, that there has to be a process to describe and maintain that. There has to be a longitudinal view. So the idea that we are not making big decisions based on a one-time event or a one-time assessment, it is longitudinal, gathering data multiple points. That we have to have workplace-based assessment. It cannot be simulation only that feeds into this decision. And again, as you think about it, there's some of those EPAs that this actually poses a challenge for because our students are currently not being given the opportunity to do some of this. Informed consent is a great example. There's some schools that completely prohibit students from entering orders based on the medical legal ramifications of that. And so it would be very difficult to deem someone untrustable if they've never been given the opportunity to try it at all. Again, think about EPA 10 with uh, recognizing a deteriorating, deteriorating patient and implementing care. Another one, many students have never had the opportunity to be the first line provider trying to decide is this patient sick or not sick, um, and so giving them an opportunity. Explicitly measuring trustworthiness, it needs to be multimodal evidence. We do think that the process of having formative feedback throughout is actually really important. And this idea of how do we make sure that our learners are active participants. This is not something that's being done to them, but there's something being pulled in and actually helping with. And so we, we have tried to be very thoughtful. We have occasionally brought students into our groups to help inform that, which we have found to be very helpful. As we think about the things that set schools up to actually succeed, uh, George and Bonnie both mentioned some of these things. Schools that already have some type of longitudinal relationship in place find moving to this type of entrustment committee with longitudinal data easier, whether that be coaching, advising, mentoring, some version of that. Some longitudinal integrated clerkships is a, is a nice example. Something where there's a longitudinal relationship that allows that uh, trainee's performance to be observed over time can be really helpful. Those that have portfolios already are a step ahead of the game because there's information going into a repository to be viewed. And then especially if you can use those analytic systems to display it in a way that allows you to make decisions. And again, I think both Bonnie and George both showed examples from OHSU and from Vanderbilt of how to do that. And then the group actually thought pretty hard and long about this idea of learner handovers. 
there's a lot of controversy around it, but feeling pretty, pretty strongly that that idea of helping the students move through in a developmentally appropriate fashion actually probably means the clerkship that they're moving from, moving into, both knowing what the student's strengths and weaknesses are. The same thing probably for moving from UME to GME, that it actually behooves those GME leaders to know what the strengths and weaknesses are. Again, we alluded to that this morning. So the major shift that is probably inherent in this type of process is moving from identifying those struggling students and helping them to looking at every student and trying to figure out how do we help them grow, how do we assess them in a way that makes sure, make sure that they are progressing appropriately. The quantity and quality of assessment data is really important. And again, it comes back to the data, right? It, it's very nice to have a dashboard full of points. You can make a lot more informed decision than if you had three points on those dashboards that we looked at earlier. So part of that is predicated on a system that actually has both good quality data and enough of it put into the system. And with that comes the conversations we had earlier about funding, the time to do the actual assessment, the time to develop the portfolio, to develop the dashboards, et cetera. All right. So this is the website for the core EPA pilot. There's a lot of information that's housed there. We try to keep the website updated with new things that the group comes up with even before they're published in the academic journals to hopefully inform the growing community. All of this with the idea that we can take our, our learner, we can actually deem them entrustable on those 13 core activities, and we can do it in a way where you understand from a GME perspective what we did, and you actually trust those decisions that we made. All right, we'll move to questions in just a minute. Thank you all. Questions? Did everybody hear the question? The idea of how long do I have to train him to trust people to trust? It's really hard. Uh, and I don't know that there's an easy answer. I think it does highlight the importance of faculty development. Part of it, it goes back to the idea of a shared mental model that was brought up earlier. That if we're all working under the same assumption with the same language, with the same framework, everybody would be a little bit more understanding of the students that they've just observed. Um, that being said, I think it's still hard. My Vanderbilt stamp of entrustability might or might not mean something to you if my trainee were coming to rotate with you. That was a justification study. Now I have a clarification study. Please. What are the preconditions in me to get me as one of your faculty to be able to do this? Yes, I, so I think that's a great study. Um, there's a little bit of literature, I believe, out there. Um, faculty members that have had a bad experience Obviously, you're going to shield toward being a little bit more um, cautious um, and probably not allowing people to do things if they've been sued recently, if they've had a bad outcome. If they've, and so I think there probably are some factors related to the recent practice, availability of biases and some of those things. There probably are other things that are more related to where did they train? And we talked earlier this morning about the imprinting, if you will. I have to imagine if you train at an institution where all of the faculty are very used to an entrustability mindset and thinking about that, if you go through that as a resident and then graduate, you're going to have more of that mindset. So I think that there are probably programmatic factors, um, but it's a great, it would be a great study. Please. So uh, Lou, um, just two very quick comments. One of them with the ad hoc judgments is that this idea of crowdsourcing the evaluation judgments. So you have to think about instead of having one grader at the end of a clerkship, eight weeks long or whatever it happens to be, now you're having hundreds of faculty members every day providing feedback. And so the stakes of each judgment drop and you can start to see the power of the big data around evaluation judgments. Will there be outliers? Of course, but now we can pull data and say, oh, you know, it's like the, it's like the old Olympic judges, right? Oh, you're from East Germany, we're not gonna, we're gonna throw you out, right? Um, it, and we'll likely do that. The other thing is that what we're seeing is that the students are becoming activated in their in co-learning and co-assessment. So they're the ones that are saying, are you kidding me? You gave me a four, are you crazy? Right? And, and so the students will, just like with the with alternate health records, they become the more proficient persons and can hopefully regulate or, or um, adjust the adjustment, the assessment. So will there be fact development? Of course there will be. 
but it, it won't be as hard as I think every people are thinking about this, especially on the supervision skills. And just to clarify that, are you kidding me, Art? So in the EPAC study, what they have shown, so you know, these are students who are getting very intensive, don't ask about how expensive it is, they're looking at it. So it's very resource intensive. They've been accepted into the pediatric program. And when they're saying, you're kidding me, you gave me a four, um, they are actually saying, I really deserve a three because I know I need to keep working on this. They are truly co-learners and co-assessors and sort of that mind shift of, um, I'm striving to become the best pediatrician I can be. They've seen within that and they're looking to publish it. And then Karen Hauer and her group has done one study looking at the assessor. Um, and I think we need to do more of that um, in, in terms of entrustability. And another thing is more senior folks are more likely to entrust than more junior folks, probably because they have more experience. I think we need to continue to do more studies of those things. In the way that you are describing trustability or the trustworthiness, is the working group envisioning that as something that stands alone from the individual EPAs, or is there an element of trustworthiness in the way you are conceptualizing it for each professional activity? Good question. I, I think those who else are in the group, feel free to comment, that it really is something that's standalone, and that it's very difficult in the moment of observing. You could, might be able to comment on, I didn't think you were completely truthful here, but the, the data we would want to support trustworthiness kind of at the higher level summative type decision would be almost separate from the specific activities. Uh, terrific, terrific talk, but uh, lots of layers to it. My question though is, in terms of the training of the faculty, uh, what would be useful, and maybe it does exist already, is sort of a training manual for those faculty because it, it's just not everybody who's going to be able to come to some of those things just like that. Some may be more comfortable, some not. So some uniformity of the training of them that could then be just shared generally would be a good outcome of that working group, I would think. So one of the things I didn't mention, it's an absolutely great point, is that to just hand a frontline faculty member the purple book, even the smaller version of it, and expect them to read all the detail is, is a lot. Um, so the, the working group, the pilot group, has actually worked on a series of one-page schematics that break down all of the core pieces for a given EPA, one-page uh, overview that can obviously be gone into a lot more detail. The, the faculty development group within the pilot is also working through, there are a lot of different faculty groups that need different development. So just saying that go develop the faculty is not sufficient. The frontline faculty need different education than those that are going to be on the entrustment committee. They're going to need different than the curriculum plan. And so we are trying to break out what are those different groups and then what do they actually need also. So yeah, it's a great point. <coughs> Multiple hands. You got a microphone. Yeah, Terry. hi, I'm Terry Wolpa. Um, as I've been listening to a lot of these things today, and certainly this one, what I'm struck by is the disconnect with the trajectory of where the academic health centers are going and where we're going in education. So let's take a moment to think about my academic health center, which would be represented by any of yours. They are looking at productivity, at margins, at efficiency, um, at merging with other healthcare systems, and not necessarily having education in those systems because it's about, I mean, I can go on and on here, it's really about the reach of a population, right? Um, and we're really talking about a lot of really important things in education. So I guess my question really broadly, but you know, for you is, when is that conversation going to happen at the level of the academic health care system, which is how, if at all, will the academic health care system recommit to medical education? Okay, I feel like that one is, uh, okay, Bonnie, that one is well above my pay grade. Right, uh, it's right. a fabulous question, um, Bonnie. There's, there's I don't think any answer to that, but um, interesting situation at Vanderbilt with the recent separation of the medical school from the medical center almost required kind of a recommitment or a restatement of, of mission and vision and value on the part of the medical center because you know what's their obligation, especially to medical students? Certainly the residents are important for the medical, stu the medical center, but to medical students. And we're actually in the process of building kind of a portfolio or building the case. And this is something that we've talked about um, in the consortium for a while is that how do you demonstrate that value? Um, I think we have to have some good way of, um, of articulating, I guess, the intangibles 
because I think it's going to be really difficult for all of this to end up with a dollar sign in front of it. Um, and, and also making sure that people recognize that those intangibles are important, like workforce development, pipeline, um, all, all kinds of things that, that can be translated into how much money do you save on faculty recruitment if you keep your residents here. So I, I think it's an important question and it would be pretty nice maybe to work on that collaboratively. Um, right. Yeah, along those lines, there is work at the GEA and with the GBA looking at a business canvas model for how to make the business case for a lot of the educational interventions that we're doing. Kim Lomas is part of that. There's many that are part of the GA, GEA work that are looking at that, but I think it's, it's really important. Bill, let me just make one other quick comment to, to follow up, Bonnie. Um, one of the things we're looking at with the pilot is um, uh, there are schools that are, have more resources than others, and so if you will, what are the minimum amounts of resources or what are the critical areas of resource that commitment that has to occur? Uh, it, it's not fair to expect, um, you know, X, Y, Z. Just the, just the coaches alone is a huge investment uh, for the schools that have done it. So, so you, we, we're going to be looking at, at that as part of this whole um, evaluation piece. So I think you all said it really well. Um, so Jerry was sort of mouthing AMC, so I figured I better grab the mic. But um, <laughs> yeah, no. But I think it, it goes back to the entire conversation of the morning, which is I think education has sort of separated. Medical education has, in some ways, and for a long time, been somewhat separated from clinical. Right? It was two years basic science, and then we've been moving in that direction. Um, I think the recognition of the role of the health system science as a pillar is the beginning of things, but we really do need to make that value argument that education, I would actually say pipeline, through CPD, when it's done right, and we need to show, we do need to show it, Lou, in some ways, um, will improve um, the value proposition of the, I would actually say the quadruple aim. Um, and that's that's what we need to do. We need to really get the health systems more within that conversation. And we're too siloed, actually, at this point. And yeah, I think the AMC is one of many forces that can contribute to that conversation. I think actually all of the, the accrediting bodies can as well. And I think the medical schools need to be part of that conversation also. Okay, so we're going to take a break now. But I would ask that people go into the poster room because we want to do our poster session. So if you get a chance to look around at the posters and we're going to get back here and keep on time at 315.